I think that uh, what I would be in favor of and what I've spoken for over the period of the last several years is to de-escalate the conflict instead of escalating the conflict. I would have, as I said two years ago, I would have uh, stopped the bombing of the North, I would have gone to the negotiating table, and I would have seen if we could settle that s struggle peacefully at the negotiating table. I think it was a mistake not to do so, and I criticized it at the time. I think we should go to the negotiating table at now and do as President Johnson said, uh, oh, I want to shake my hand. That's almost the nicest thing that's happened to me tonight. <laughs> Excuse me, go ahead. Right. Well, I don't think that uh, the question was uh, in view of the fact that the administration said they'd go any time, any place to negotiate. And uh, the uh, North Vietnamese said they'd go to Phnom Penh, and then they said that they would go to Warsaw. I can see the uh, argument against going to Phnom Penh and the fact that we have no embassy facilities there. I can see the argument against going to Warsaw on the grounds that it's not a neutral country. I don't see, however, uh, I think that the statement that we made initially should have been we will go anytime, any place except Phnom Penh or Warsaw. What is the, what would you, the, the lady back there, could I, how will I treat people who's, who deserted? No, I don't expect to give them amnesty. No. The question was, what would I do for those who deserted from the army or the navy, would I give them amnesty? And uh, I would have no plans to give them amnesty. I'd like to hear my reason, uh, and any more than I would uh, as far as those who've gone to Canada. I think, uh, I think that there are a lot of young men, there are a lot of young men who don't want to go in the war. There are a lot of young men who uh, were shot at in the Second World War that didn't like to go and be shot at, and there are a lot of people that don't want to go in this war. And uh, there are a lot of poor, there are a lot of black people who have gone to Vietnam, there's only 10% of this population in the United States who is Negro, but there's 20% of those who are serving in Vietnam and have been wounded or killed who are Negro. Now they've gone, if you let me just finish, they have gone, they have gone and risked their lives. Many of them didn't want to leave their families. Many of them didn't want to leave their homes. Many of them didn't want to leave their communities to go and be shot at in the jungles of South Vietnam. They went there, they faced it. They sh uh, And I think that, uh, that uh, those people, those people who have made that effort, uh, compared to those who have made some different decision, I can understand if somebody in their conscience decides that they won't go. But in that case, I think that they have to face the penalty of the law of the land. And I don't think a part of that, I don't think part of that is either deserting, and I don't think part of that is going to Canada. If you believe in your conscience that the war is wrong and you can't go, then you should face the music here in the United States and stand up and think. <laughs> Next time I come to San Francisco, would I come home, go to your home for dinner? Well, what will I tell them at my home? <laughs> but can we, can we talk about it afterwards? <laughs> Thank you very much, though. Voting age at 18. We tried to get a voting age at 18 in the state of New York. The Republicans opposed it. I understand a vote, a, some legislation that's been offered here. I think you should make an effort to try to pass it in the state of California. What? 
Can I just listen to him for a moment? The lady, the young, the lady, yeah, go ahead. This uh, happy time, this happening, must come to an end. Uh, let me just say what a, I was about to say what a pleasure it's been being with you, but I caught myself in time. I want to, I want to say how, uh, Ladies and gentlemen, thank you. Thank Senator Kennedy for his wonderful presence. Nice signs, and then the support. I had a little. I think men are entitled to decent employment at decent wages, and I don't dole, and that brought happiness. I think what people want, and what you've demonstrated, I think that we should make it clear to the government of South Vietnam that they have to end the corruption and the dishonesty that exists within that government. I think we. I think we have to make it, and we should have made it clear a long, long time ago that as we were drafting our young men, that they should also draft their 18-year-olds and their 19-year-olds. I, I think that we should make it clear to them that a young man in South Vietnam cannot buy his way out of the draft any more than he can buy his way out of the draft here in the United States. In favor of accepting what President Johnson said several weeks ago, and what he said over the period of the last several years, that we go any place, any time, and have negotiations. I think we should start those negotiations now. And I would begin after that conflict is ended, recognizing that we're going to have to negotiate with the National Liberation Front, and also recognizing that the National Liberation Front of the Viet Cong is going to play some role in the future political process of South Vietnam. We might not like it, it might be a dangerous course, but the fact is that those people are going to have to live together in the same land, and those who are now fighting against one another are going to have to work together eventually. And I think we have to accept the fact that the National Liberation Front is going to play some role in the future political process of that country. And I'd end the war and the $85 million that it's costing us every day the $600 million it's costing us every week, the $30 billion that it's costing us every year, and I'd start taking care of our own people here in the United States. <laughs> this state, this state is known for all of its, for something else here in the United States. And it's not just our military power and our economic power. It's our ideals and our principles. And they're the things that have to be foremost in our mind. And if I'm elected president of the United States, that's what we're going to concentrate on.
right, ladies and gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, let me present very quickly to you the person sharing the platform so that we can hear Senator Kennedy. Yes. The Congressman from the 5th Congressional District. I gather it is a strong voice and it is a clear voice, but it's not a unanimous voice. <laughs> I had that feeling as I entered the hall and I met that young gentleman who left. And he said, you are a fascist pig. So I... I thought that that was a nice, warm welcome in San Francisco. But, but you know what we'll do? We'll, I'll be glad to answer any questions that anything might have. And uh, we'll, we'll proceed that way. I have a marvelous speech, but I'll, be, I'll suspend the speech for a little while. And I'll be glad to answer any questions that anybody has. I just... I want to say how nice it is to be in San Francisco. You tell me first. Okay, well, should I answer that? Well, the question was, why uh, am I running for president and why do I think that I can... First, I think that uh, probably the only person that can find the answers for either the United States or for our position around the world is uh, probably uh, God. Unfortunately, he's not running. But I went through, uh, I went through, uh, what do you want, Dan? What we should do is let each one of us speak, and then I let her speak, and now I get a chance, do I? But I went through a uh, series of experiences when I was in the executive branch of the government. I went through the Cuban Missile Crisis. I saw how close we came to not only destroying uh, the United States, but uh, destroying all of mankind in a nuclear exchange. I also uh, saw in 1963 what can be done in trying to have a reconciliation and an understanding with uh, our adversaries, the Soviet Union, when we signed the Test Ban Treaty, uh, which means so much not only to this generation of Americans, but to the next generation and the next generation after that. I went through the Berlin crisis of 1961 and 1962, and I was involved in uh, domestic matters uh, such as the civil rights struggle of the early 1960s. And, uh, and I've been involved over the period of the last uh, several years in the uh, problems of our cities and the problems of poverty. I want to, uh, I think that uh, uh, in the last analysis, it's a question of whether we can preserve our peace, whether we can preserve uh, the tranquility uh, and peace of our own land, and whether we can contribute to the peace all over the rest of the globe. I think based on those experiences and the strong feelings I have about what needs to be done, that I can make some contribution. The place that I can make that contribution, it seems to me, is running for President of the United States. That's I don't run for a president on the basis that I have the answers to all of these matters. I run on the basis of the fact that I feel strongly about these things. I have some ideas about how they can be resolved, 
I have uh, some ideas about how we can preserve the security of our own land. I have some ideas about how we can also make agreements with our adversaries. And I have some ideas about how we can avoid being involved in further Vietnams in the future. And that's what I intend.